Now for the grand finale. We'll hear from um, Elodie Gaden. I, Elodie is someone I've known quite a long time. She's totally terrific, and now MacArthur even thinks so. So she is a MacArthur awardee. I knew Elodie from her work at, at Tiger. She's now at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Um, focuses mainly on parasites, um, everything from um, elephantiasis, onchocerciasis, and leishmaniasis, and any other iasis, right? <laughs> right. And um, she has, has done some tremendous stuff. She's from, actually, are you a Canadian? You yep. went to McGill. Yep. And then um, postdoc <laughs> at um, NIH. Great. So let's hear from you. Thank you, Rita. I must say it's been uh, an amazing two days just meeting all of you and hearing your stories and putting in some science. It's been really exciting. So I do think we are the science girls gone wild, okay? <laughs> now, of course, we had our predecessors and they didn't look that wild, but really they were in their days because they were the pioneers. And here, actually, these uh, it's a picture of three um, chemistry students at University of Pennsylvania that I found on the web, so I thought it was pretty cool. What I realized, um, in my, my short career is that I actually collaborate with a lot of women. And I often put that acknowledgement slide at the end of a talk. Well, actually, this is the acknowledgement that I'm going to do for 15 minutes about all these people I work with. But I'll go just through a few of the women that I do find extraordinary and that have changed a bit the course of my life in, in my career. And, you know, women, Women are extraordinary in a way because I, I like this quote from Ann Richards that Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did. She just did it backwards and in high heels. And I find that a lot of the women I work with are exactly that way. They do it backwards and in high heels. Now, of course, science is collaborative. Um, I don't think we can do science anymore without these collaborations. And I, I love collaborative work. I, I work in a lab environment where it's all shared labs, like it was a tiger. And um, I see some of my colleagues like working in these really small labs, and I really detest this. But that means I also collaborate with a lot of men. I just won't talk about them today, but there are some extraordinary men that I have worked with. So when I talk about um, the stuff I do, I actually like to show my little tree of uh, the, uh, the nodes in my tree represent a bit the little paths I took, and I'll talk a bit about that. But I, I put it in function of the organisms I work on uh, because uh, the people I've met I have actually helped direct a bit my, a lot actually, my research, and I've become agnostic on what organism I work on. So I'm, when I define myself, I'm an infectious disease genomics person. I just dabble in anything that's alive and that can infect you. And I find it all fascinating. But I've interacted with a lot of women at different stages. And because I work on infectious diseases, I work with people who do a lot of work in the field, a lot of women who do work in the field. I'll mention some of them. Uh, I fit in more in the middle where it's the, the lab type person, and more the molecular aspects. And because I work on neglected tropical diseases, I must say there are a lot of things going on with women in developing countries. So to just give you a, a brief arc of my career, I actually, um, I'm Canadian, as Rita mentioned, and I went to McGill University. And it, when I was at McGill in biology, I actually didn't know who this was, Ariad Harriet Brooks, uh, she's actually Canada's first female nuclear physicist, and she was actually the first female to get a master's degree from McGill. But I had never heard of her, which is extraordinary when you think she's the first woman at McGill. I, I wish there was a building named after her, but there isn't. There's a building named after uh, her mentor, Rutherford. She actually went on to work with Marie Curie. She ended up in the US. 
And she uh, uh, contributed to uh, the description of radon and uh, did a lot of work in radioactivity. And actually, a lot of the work she did ended up in, the dis uh, in discoveries that led to a Nobel Prize. But of course, she was, she was not included. Um, so a little bit of a story we've heard of in this society. And, uh, uh, and in her day, uh, of course, she got married. And in those days, you couldn't be married and still work in research. So she had to get out. So I must say that's that's maybe the, the first woman in my life without knowing her. She was important um, as a pioneer of uh, a woman in research. But what changed my, uh, my career is after I did uh, biology at McGill, I actually was a crummy student. I wasn't that great. I loved biology. I just didn't really do very well at it. I ended up uh, moving to another university to do my master's. And actually, while I was at McGill, what a bit, uh, since we're all telling our stories, what uh, a bit made me uh, not too excited about research is I had been working in a lab uh, for a few summers uh, with uh, in this ecology lab. And uh, I'm a person who wakes up in a good mood. And it actually, it takes a lot of effort to put me, to get me in a bad mood. So I'd always be smiling this slab of these very important postdocs and graduate students. And one graduate student took me aside one day and said to me, Elodie, you have to stop smiling and stop being happy because it makes you look like a silly girl. And I felt so like crushed. And uh, so he said, you know, people don't think you're very smart. So uh, when I fast forward to 2011, I get my MacArthur and that graduate student who told me that sent me an email out of the blue and he said, it was so deserved, the MacArthur. I'm like, from completely left field here, but anywho. So I ended up uh, doing a master's in environmental sciences. And while I was doing that, I actually read a book that really changed what I wanted to do. And it's called The Malaria Capers by Robert Desowitz. And it's about the tale of parasitologists. And a few years later, I ended up meeting uh, many of these parasitologists at the NIH where I did my postdoc. And that book really uh, was really important for me. I found it absolutely fascinating uh, what these people were doing in research. And by the way, n no women, come to think of it, are, are really in these stories. But at the time, while I was reading the book, I was actually in Africa doing um, water quality work uh, in Senegal. And actually, I, I'm putting up this paper because it was my first paper. It's a crummy paper, but it doesn't matter. It was important to me at the time. But while I was there, I was in the Sahel. And, and just look how arid it is, OK? And the water is uh, incredibly important because you have that lake and you have nothing else. And so people are very dependent on that lake. And actually, there are vectors of schistosomiasis, another iasis, uh, which is a, a bad parasitic worm, and uh, sand flies, which are the vectors of leishmaniasis, which is, uh, it can be visceral leishmaniasis or cutaneous leishmaniasis. They're, they're terrible diseases. So while I'm reading this parasitology book, I'm encountering people infected with these, paras with these parasites. And they're fascinating parasites. They really are. And to make this connection between these organisms and the, the women in Africa that I could see the, the, while we're taking our little water tests that we're doing, and they were ma mainly chemical tests, a bit bacteriology tests, I would have these mothers shoving these kids at me and saying, do you have drugs to help us? You know, our kids, and you, you've seen that, Rita. And, and you feel so helpless. So uh, when I finished my, when I came back to Canada and I finished my master's, I actually wanted to work in parasitology. Found one lab at McGill University that did work on leishmaniasis. And so I came up to him and he said, you're the first person who even knows what leishmaniasis is. And so I ended up doing my PhD at the Institute of Parasitology at McGill. And that led me to do my postdoc at the NIH in the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases. But incidentally, uh, when I uh, arrived at McGill uh, for my, my PhD, 
So in Canada, and I don't know um, if it's like that, Lynette, even where you studied, uh, she's my fellow Canadian, is that you, you don't do exams to get into grad school. You're ex we were just accepted into the programs. I was just accepted in the program. And then I found out six months later, I, was a, I had a one-year-old child. And I found out from the other graduate students that the, uh, the uh, PI had said if he had known I had a child, he would never have hired me in the lab, uh, which I thought was a little strange. He had a stay-at-home uh, wife, um, but he's a, a great guy, but it was just a very strange thing to, to say. But anyway, I continued working on these parasites, but then that's where my career took another direction again. And that was actually when I joined the Institute for Genomic Research. They were doing, at the time, um, three genomes of uh, related organisms to, uh, to Leishmania, the trypanosomatids, so these, the tri-trip genome uh, project, it was called. And it had taken me three years to, to decode one gene of this organism, and here was this institute uh, that was doing this whole genome, all these genomes really quickly, so it was like a, a baby in a candy store. It was just wonderful. And that's where I met an extraordinary woman who actually changed again the course of the, the direction of my work. And that's Claire Fraser. Many of you know her. And uh, what I like about Claire and about a a lot of these women that I've met throughout my, my career is that they're completely uh, uh, fierce women that don't really let convention stop them. And they're also the type to say, why? Why are things like that? Why can't we do things the way we want to do them? And also, you know, why not study something of interest even if you may not have the expertise? So I was interested, I got interested in viruses, and I'm not a virologist, but the lab I did my PhD in was working on vir viruses and parasites. And it was talking with Claire. I told her I wanted to do a little project on uh, virus genomics, uh, you know, looking at you know all kinds of different viruses. And I was interested in RNA-based viruses. And uh, Claire said, "Great, go for it. Here's money. Have fun." And and I did. I ended up meeting these people. And then she got this huge grant from the NIH to start the influenza genome project. And she turned to me. She goes want to do it? And I said, great. And that really took me in another direction. And all of a sudden, I became a uh, named a virologist. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> I know I'm not. But the MacArthur put me as a parasitologist and virologist. And I told them, I said, I'm not a virologist. They said, but you are a parasitologist. I said, yeah, yeah, that I am. But, um, but in working on these parasites I, uh, and the viruses, I met great people. But the, the parasite work is fascinating. So I mentioned the three organisms. And uh, you know, I'm just showing this to you to, to, to show you the importance of these neglected tropical diseases, one-fifth of the world's population at risk. Uh, many men, of course, many women. And it seems to affect uh, women culturally differently because they can be very disfiguring. And so that's the, um, the trypanosomatids, so that it's a protozoa. Uh, the, the, there are different protozoa that cause these three types of diseases. And the worm I work on, lymphatic filariasis, look at this, this is elephantiasis. I mean, it, it's really devastating. And you have a, a huge number of people who are at risk, 1.5 billion at risk, 50% are children. It's just incredible. But uh, beyond the, the, the in, very devastating diseases these cause, they're fascinating organisms. And for example, lymphatic filariasis can be caused by um, three different types of worms, one being Brugia malayi. So here, this is a picture that a colleague of mine took where you have the Brugia worm on top of C. elegans. And most people know C. elegans. It's also a nematode. And when you do the comparative analyses of the genomes, you have one that's a free-living 
worm, the C. elegans, and then you have that parasitic worm. And morphologically, they're very different, but they have a lot of very similar genes. Uh, what's interesting about this uh, parasitic worm is that it also has an endosymbiotic bacteria. So there's a lot of really interesting biology to do. And while studying the genome of, of that worm and the Wolbachia, that's when I met another extraordinary woman whom I suspect is the woman who um, nominated me for the MacArthur, but she would never tell. But I, I have strong suspicions she's the one. So here's a woman who nominated a woman for an important award, and I think that's, that's really important. But Sarah is at the New York Blood Center, and she's one of these women who's really taught me to, she's been an amazing mentor, and she's one of these women who are, is always telling me, go for it, honey, don't worry, don't worry, go for it. She's always, you know, I can call her anytime and I'll say, what do I do in this situation? She advises me, she's scared of nobody. Um, so I, she's really an amazing uh, role model. And uh, we do a lot of work on onchocerciasis because that's really uh, one of her uh, fields of expertise. And she's collected worms herself in the field, and we're, uh, you know, we're analyzing the genome right now of this worm. Another woman I've met through these connections in the the worm field because I wasn't in initially a worm parasitologist was uh, Shelley Mikulski, who's in a small, she's at University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, uh, but she's one of these crazy women who also is scared of nothing and goes out in the field and collects these, all these worms all the time. And uh, one of her interests is actually to look at the different stages of the worms and then analyze the um, the, uh, the RNA expression at these different stages, but Shelley is also one of these people I met through these connections uh, of working on these, uh, these parasites. But then, uh, so Tiger is no more. Now it's called the J. Craig Venter Institute. And at the time, Tiger was sort of uh, starting to fold. It was changing, uh, morphing into something else. And at that time, my husband, who's a physician and was, had just finished his residency, was hired by the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center, UPMC in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and I was the trailing spouse. And I was just so thankful that they would just give me a job uh, for going there. For a year, I commuted to Tiger every week. And then eventually, uh, I was placed in a clinical department, which was a, a mistake, a PhD in a clinical department. Just a clinical division really, really doesn't work. Um, so that was not a, a happy experience, as I was telling Saba, but nowhere near your experience. My colleagues were fine. It was the boss that wasn't really. Um, but so, um, although I was miserable in Pittsburgh when I arrived there, I met great people and again, great women. And one of these great women was actually uh, Alison Morris, who's one of these women who does, she's an MD, she does this amazing work, she has these kids, she does it all, and I don't know how she does it, and she does incredibly strong science, and she embarked on this completely crazy project to look at the, uh, the lung microbiome, so the microbiome being the uh, microbial uh, diversity that's on you know, different body sites, and she decided we should be doing the lung microbiome Biome, uh, an environment that was thought to be totally sterile before it turns out it's not, you know, but she had to pick the most uh, difficult one. But that's because she's, she works in pulmonary, uh, pulmonary division, and she's an HIV person. Um, so she's uh, really, she came to find me and she said, I know you do genomics, you do metagenomics, and I think it'd be great to do that. And that really led led me to uh, change some of the things I do in my research uh, because of this encounter with this, this woman who does fantastic work and has uh, 
uh, these amazing cohorts of patients. So that really changed the way I, I felt in Pittsburgh. And, and often it's these interactions with other people that really can, can make a difficult situation into something uh, far more interesting. But through my interactions of the different people I knew at Pitt, I met another woman who's not at Pitt. She's at UCLA, but she's an extraordinary woman. And I wanted to mention Annie Ramoyne because she is one of these people that operates under the radar, that's had to fight a lot for what she does. And she does the most difficult thing I have ever seen. What Annie does is that she does work in the Congo, so in um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but she works in the most difficult areas. And she's always struggling for funding. She's at a school of public health and struggled to get her tenure because people didn't take seriously what she does. And she works uh, with, she goes to these villages in the Congo and is um, looking at the, she's an epidemiologist, she's looking at the epidemiology of monkeypox. So monkeypox is actually uh, similar in its presentation to smallpox. And you know how we, most of us here, got vaccinated for smallpox, but the new generation is not being vaccinated. And monkeypox resembles smallpox without the um, the death toll without the high mortality, uh, but now there was cross protection with small, the smallpox vaccine, which these people don't have anymore. And so what is unknown is how the, the virus is being transmitted and whether there could be um, uh, human to human transmission of this virus. So what we're doing with uh, Annie is that she's going in these really remote areas. I mean, these are incredibly remote. And she goes to these villages and she developed these relationships with the government of the Congo, with people in the villages over the last 10 years. And she collects samples. They allow her to scrape you know, their wounds, or scrape the samples, she collects blood, she comes back, she's learned the local language, and she's been really doing work and struggling the whole time to get it funded, and uh, it, it costs a lot to do what she does. What's great about Annie is that she does work, see how she's this beautiful blonde, and this is Annie putting her mascara on using the, uh, I love this picture. They're like, what is she doing? And she's like, <laughs> with the mirror of her motorcycle. I love that. So anyway, these are uh, incredibly rich encounters I've had uh, with these women that have really changed what I study. So when I find the woman really cool, I'm like, this is great. I want to study that. So it's fun to not be attached to something in particular and be interested in research in general. But the, my next move is in a few uh, months, I'm moving to NYU. I'll be in the same department as Carol, and I'm incredibly um, excited about it because that you know, NYU and the environment uh, in biology, I'll have a joint appointment in biology and public health He's very nurturing to women. And I know that from my friend Jane Carlton, who was a tiger with me. And when I moved to Pitt, she moved to the School of Medicine at NYU and was not happy there at all, and then ended up in biology. And so uh, when a position opened up at NYU uh, in biology, Jane said, you should apply. I said, no, I'm the trailing spouse. She goes, oh, shut up, just apply, OK? And so I did, and NYU helped find a job for my husband. So, And it gave me some confidence, too, because I always thought I'll always be the trailing spouse. He's the doctor. You know, I'm just the wife. So, um, so the, my new one of my new bosses is actually going to be Cheryl Hilton, and I don't know if any of you have heard of her, but Cheryl is a uh, very powerful woman who was at Columbia for I think 20 years, and she actually was the CEO of the Legacy Foundation that did a lot of work on the tobacco settlement. She's a fascinating person, so I think one day we should have Cheryl come talk here, and I think that would be really interesting. But Jane is, uh, Jane is a really cool individual. And Jane was telling me the story. So she does a lot of work in India. She works on malaria and also on Trichomonas vaginalis, which is, um, uh, uh, of course, an infectious disease. And um, 
uh, sexually transmitted um, organism. But uh, Jane uh, told me that uh, in one of her uh, jobs, and I won't name which one, when she interviewed, she uh, negotiated really well. And she was told, uh, oh, uh, you did well, you negotiated like a man. And I said, well, that's good. And she goes, no, it was meant as an insult. And I said, and was it a man or a woman? She said, it was a woman. Who told her that? So I think that's interesting, you know. So, um, but Jane has done uh, a lot of work and she's one of these people who's, uh, I think, has always been sure of herself. There are just people like that. And Jane is, is one of these people that I, I really use as a role model on how to interact with others because she's never aggressive, but people listen to her. She's published more, she's made more covers of nature and science that, that I've, I've known. And uh, she's made uh, some you know, prestigious covers and also not so prestigious. Her work on Trichomonas vaginalis actually led to this in interesting article in uh, Spread magazine, which is uh, the magazine of the sex industry. But this is Jane, she's like, whoo, this is great, you know? And actually when her paper was published on Trichomonas, uh, the genome, um, she, in, in one of the uh, interviews, she said, uh, yeah, if men had, uh, if, uh, if, um, uh, if, if, the, if men had these, um, the, the disease on their penises, we would get far more funding than we are now because it's considered also one of these diseases that's not well funded. But uh, when she published the paper, she distributed these condom boxes, and I thought that's great. You know, people have mugs or T-shirts, and Jane has condom boxes. That's typical Jane. So this is just the story of the, the women I've met that I find are, are great. So I've had a great experience with meeting these really strong and important uh, women. And, and of course, one that's changed my life a couple of years ago is Catherine MacArthur. I had to put her up, of course, her husband uh, too. Uh, now, of course, they've passed away, but that, that award did, uh, at, you know, when Sarah was talking about how all of a sudden it validates what you're doing, and it really did that for me. One of the first talks I gave, I think a week after I got the award, I had been invited to give this, this lecture, and it was the first time that I had a captive audience where, you know, I'd make a joke and everybody was like, ha, 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 as if I was the wittiest person on the planet. And I know, you know, two weeks earlier, they wouldn't, they would have been like, oh yeah, whatever, you know? So it's, I think that's, that's kind of interesting. But the new generation of uh, science girls going wild. So these are actually three women in my lab, uh, a postdoc, Laura, a graduate student, and Li Jia from Tsinghua University, who's a visiting scientist. And I really tried, I hope I am mentoring them the right way. I love having women come to my lab. And also the younger generation. So I mentor also, this is Maya in eighth grade, and Maya is fierce. And I love that. The new generation is fierce. Thank you very much. I told you it was a grand finale. <laughs> <laughs> now? So um, I've been doing a lot of work on flu, actually, sequencing, uh, doing a lot of, uh, I know it doesn't sound interesting, but actually it is pretty cool. <laughs> we're, we're following these, uh, we're, we're tracking transmission networks. So we're working with people who are are epidemiologists putting moats in children in schools and then they do their social networks and see how they interact. So then we, are, we have samples from the same students who got the flu and just by the deep sequencing, we're finding unique features and tracking, seeing if we can track the viruses in, in basically with the social networks. You should uh, sequence the one that's going around Washington right now. There's one going around Washington? Yeah, right it's now. flu B probably. It's been uh, pretty bad this year. Any other questions? I think everybody All right. has had an extraordinary Thank day. Thank you. Thank you.